long in, in 2015 about hope. And uh, this, this may be, yeah, I don't know about that, but we'll see. This may be um, the, uh, the most difficult place to find hope. And that is hope in our being corrected. Uh, yeah, where is, so here's my question, so where's the hope in that? Where, where is the hope in correction? Um, I was thinking about that this week in my office, and I thought, you know, we, we resist being disciplined. No one likes to be told, you know, what to do. Uh, very few of us are looking for unsolicited advice into our lives. People who kind of, you know, uh, they, don't, they don't know exactly what we need to hear, but we don't want to hear it, right? And so there, there we are in the middle of that, and someone, someone's going to tell us something. Or, or how about this? The, the people that come alongside us, and they can, you know, they can see everything that needs to change, and so they want to talk us into those changes. The most befuddling thing about unsolicited advice and changes and being told is that 99.9% .9 of the time, these folks are right, and we don't like it. <laughs> It just kind of rubs us a little bit. Um, the story of Joseph is an experience that he has that if we, um, if we follow his breadcrumbs left for us through the dark forest of our own corrections and bring us hope. There are four insights that I gleaned from the story this year that I want to share with you this morning and, uh, and encourage us with as we, as, we think about, uh, as we think about this season. And the first is this. Recall our first plan is never our last plan. Okay? Now you just kind of think with me out loud a little bit. There's a, there is an evolution of plan that goes on in our lives. Usually the first thing you come up with is not what you're going to stick with. Now, the, the problem comes is when other people see the, the gaps in your plan before you do. That's, that's, where, that's where the rub comes. But if you have, um, you know, uh, if you live in a neighborhood, if you have a job, if you're trying to work out a marriage or you failed in marriage and you if you've ever been on a, a team of any kind, if you've spent much time in the church or some kind of club, you know that it takes a group effort to put things together. It, it takes many voices. It takes many ideas. And Joseph knows this. The key to the passage in the first part of this, in verse 18 and 19, comes along in verse 19. You've heard the whole story, so let me read this. Because... Joseph, Mary's husband, was a righteous man. He did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Oh, thanks a lot, Joseph. What a great plan. You see, Mary had come home back into kind of Joseph's life and to her mom and dad and at the bridal age of 14 told everyone in, in her uh, 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 pool of influence that, hey, I just you guys all need to know I'm, I'm pregnant, but no problem here. This is God's baby. <laughs> you know, how that message uh, must have been pretty, pretty difficult, pretty far out there for the people around her to take on. But did you notice in verse 14, it says, Joseph was a righteous man. The key for Joseph is that he was righteous and uh, others were important to him. <clears throat> so Joseph goes about uh, hatching a plan and, and then there's, there's, there's some rethink time and we're going to come to that. But, but th there's two things when we think about uh, coming together with, with what God would have for us. And first, um, does our plan meet God's standard? Does our plan meet God's Jesus is standing. And second for Joseph, does our plan bless those whom the plan involves? I, uh, I got myself involved in ministry, camp ministry, in the YMCA early on in my ministry. 
And that was in a pretty dark day for the Y. I don't know if they've corrected it much, but uh, most people in the YMCA or the YWCA didn't know what the C stood for, Young Men's Christian Association. So, uh, but I, I got involved in a franchise that was actually trying to hire uh, Christians to lead the, the YMCA. And they had a, a, a beautiful slogan, and we used it a lot when we were in camp setting or we were doing a job. And if things got tight, if unity got stretched, if, if people kind of got um, a little bristled up with what was going on, we would say this, I am third. Because God was first, others were second, and I am third. You see, I think plans are doomed if they're all about our plan, and we have no room for, for anyone else's. Notice the word here, Joseph was righteous. It didn't say Joseph was always right or pretended to be or tried to always look right because he was kind of the leader and you know maybe everything would fall apart if the if you know if the believers in the community didn't see Joseph. It said he was righteous. We'll come back and talk to that again. It it doesn't say that he was always right. And it also doesn't include that he was always trying to get his rights. There's a there's a quite a bit of controversy right now about uh, you know as if someone can steal our rights. You know when we came under the grace of the cross, we gave up our right to ourselves. It's no longer an issue. Now people are kind of grappling to to, to, to kind of get that back. You know there's it, we are so precious to God. We we we. Uh, we matter so much to God that God's not going to let anything happen to the Christian church that doesn't need to happen for His glory. Uh, but we forget that, especially when we see tragic things happen. Joseph was righteous. Others were important. His first plan wasn't his last plan. Uh, so, so second insight, first insight, recall uh, our first plan is never our last. Second insight, uh, allow for flexibility in your plan. Look at verse 20. But after he considered this, just kind of stop right there. You know, he had the plan all worked out. And after he considered these things, so he's still meditating, he's still praying, he's still reviewing. He has the personal spiritual strength to say the, something that, that very few people can say about their own plan. What if my plan isn't right? What if my point of view isn't all that? And this is what Joseph is thinking about when all of a sudden this angel appears to him in a dream. And tells him everything that Mary had already told him. Joseph remains open. He refuses to make his plan bulletproof. He refuses to put it in concrete. Many, many believers today, this is, this is when that ill-fated disease comes in. Hardening of the categories. You know, people just start doubling down on, on the, their view of how it's going to be. And if people push, they just push back. They have no real sense of self-awareness. I wonder how this sounds. Joseph had this understanding. You know, I've said this myself, but I hear it over and over and over again. I wish an angel of the Lord would come and tell me how to make the next step. But you see, um, as we read in Zechariah's story, for, for many of us that would not matter. An angel only comes to someone who's willing to change their heart on where they're at now. Very few people get an angel visit that says, oh yeah, you're all right. Just keep, keep going in that pig-headed way. You see. Angels come. God releases in a time in which people are listening. In fact, someone walked out of the, the church and, and, uh, and, and helped, me, uh, helped me this morning by saying, you know, we probably see angels all the time unaware. And that's scriptural too, isn't it? 
we probably all the time are entertaining those that come alongside. If we're listeners, if we're people who are third, God first, others, then we have room, we have space in our lives to listen to others. Insight number three, check the scriptures. Uh, verse 22 says, all this took place to fulfill what God had said through the prophet. And then he reads this prophecy. The virgin shall be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, because Joseph knew and sought the scriptures, he recognized that passage. And when that passage began to be read, the first thing that Joseph thought of is, that's the first scroll of Isaiah. Many Christians today, you can quote the scriptures. Oh, well, that's, that's a cool idea. Where would you get that? The Bible. Where does that come from? Do we recognize what God is doing, and when God is doing it. You see, for Joseph, the scriptures were in, informed in his life. Him being one of the, the, the great, 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 great grandsons of King David. Knew from his own experience that he and his lineage had not only... Um, known the word they had been participants in writing God's word it's powerful Joseph wasn't the kind of person who went to the Bible to find a point that would hold up his opinion nor did he go to the Bible when he was in trouble and needed something he was just constantly going to God's word so he could speak to him on a daily basis Joseph was the kind of person that could hear God's word and understand what God had for him in his life. You might ask the question this morning for yourself, how is God's word being formed in my life? What is going on in the word of God that is influencing my life on a daily basis? in matters that I might consider very important or not important at all? Where are the vital messages of God to our heart being picked up, being heard, or being altogether disregarded because we're just too busy? We're just too involved in everything else. The fourth insight is yield to obedience. It says in verse 24 that Joseph woke up and did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. Joseph was strengthened by his obedience. The more he obeyed, the more he obeyed. As long as he couldn't find a, um, a way in which he could slip out of a difficult obedience. Have you ever done that? Ever, ever sensed that something might be a little too difficult, a little too hard, and you find yourself slipping out? You know, I heard God say that really strong yesterday on Sunday, but it's Monday afternoon, and I don't think I, I haven't got to it. I don't think I For, for Joseph, his obedience to the passage was first and was lasting. First thing he did when he got up the next morning. You know, we, 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 we place a lot during this time the story of Mary and all that she went through. After all, she had to carry the baby and, and go through what appeared to be, uh, you, you know, the embarrassment of everything that happened. But, but think about Joseph for a minute. Not only does he, uh, you know, is he responsible for this child, but it's really, in that sense, not his son. And he doesn't name this son either. Joseph gets up that first thing in the morning, and he goes and finds Mary, who is has probably gone through several boxes of Kleenex. You know, no one believes him. 
No one understands and says, I love you. I care for you. Come home. He's faithful to her. Uh, uh, they have purity, uh, sexual purity in their lives until the, the, the birth of the child. And then when Joseph has this opportunity to name his son Joseph, he says, Jesus, instead. He doesn't take ownership of what God is doing to suit his preference. He doesn't split the difference with God. He seeks to understand through his life whether it is recalling that his first plan is never going to be his last, that allowing for flexibility, checking the scriptures, yielding to obedience. You know, statistics will prove this out, that Christians as well as non-Christians fall off a ladder at about the same rate. Have flat tires at about the same rate, have car wrecks, have cancer, make all the same mistakes that everyone else makes. Even the difference between what we might call nominal Christians and mature Christians. It all pretty much cuts the same way. And so you ask, so what's the difference? And the difference is this. Mature Christians not only make mistakes, but they can admit to those mistakes. They can learn from those mistakes. They can even laugh about those mistakes. The rest of Christianity is so hung up on how they look. What mistake? I didn't see that. They find themselves in a place of, of following a, a kind of obedience that God, that God never called for, for any of us. God called us to be real people. Somehow, Christianity, like Judaism before it, has gotten itself dumbed down into some kind of behavioral contract. If you just do these things, say these things, show up in these places, then it will all work out. And what God really wants is for us to enter into a relational covenant with Him. In relationships, we listen. In relationships, we make mistakes and we learn. In relationships, we get to know the heart of God and, and we allow God to know our heart. And in the Christian church, we, we, we learn this, this great uh, mercy of, of grace and uh, in flexibility and, and in God's word and in righteousness and the importance of others. So let me answer my question as we come closer to the end of this sermon. Uh, when our plans become God's plans, how is it that this brings us hope? Well, it becomes hope because when we choose God's plan for our life, we are set free. Okay? When, when we come to the end of ourselves, we find the beginning of God and we are set free. Let me say two things that, that may have eluded you, uh, uh, our church, and, and our Christian response to the world. Uh, when, when, when God's plans set us free, two things happen that, that, are, that are spoken about over and over again in, Christ, in, in, in the Scriptures. And the first is this. Now, because we're on God's plan instead of our own, God gives us strength. I can do all things through Him who gives strength means strength. That is, I can do all things that God asked me to do. And God came in the Old Testament and again and again in the New Testament saying, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your perfectionism. I, I don't want you to, to get it right. I want you to trust me to strengthen you. That's what I want. And number two is like it. Now, God is responsible for the results. We are no longer responsible for what God is calling us to do. God calls our name, and asks us to show up, and then let us let go of what God wants to do for us. Thessalonians says, the one who calls, he's speaking about God here, the one who calls is faithful, and he will do it. There was no greater belligerent control freak than the Apostle Paul, who was literally murdering and putting Christians in jail before God met him on the road 
with an I told you and some unsolicited advice and a plan for his change of life. And then everything changes for him. Like Mary before him, Joseph believes that, that God is trying to do something that would change his life. And, and let me just add this uh, to our hearts for our consideration this morning. Think about this. Whatever you do not allow God to do through you, you're going to do two things about that. You're going to, number one, make yourself responsible for it. And number two, you're going to attempt to do that in your own strength, which is going to create a lot of guilt, a lot of frustration, a lot of stress. And I, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm just saying if, if you don't allow God to do these things and you take them on, you're going to have just enough Jesus to make you miserable. Because this was not intended for you to do. The call of God in our lives was not intended for us to take those things over. It was intended for us to say, yes, I want to let that go. So, it is no longer our doing. It is no longer our succeeding. And it is no longer our image that is in play can get so futzy about our image and who we look like and how we're making God look bad if we don't do this right. And it's really kind of all about, hey, my program isn't working out. And the people are in the way. And if they just try harder or do more. And God owns none of that in Joseph's life. He's asking Joseph to find this place in, in his heart where he could just say yes to the things that God has asked him to do. Those of you who uh, know and remember Skip Benz hasn't been gone all that long. One of my favorite, one of my favorite Skippyisms is this: God is everything, or He is nothing. He is, or He isn't. It becomes that simple at this time of year. The things that have you pushed the most. The things that finally get you to go to church after all those weeks of not going to church or picking up the phone and calling a sponsor or getting a prayer request when you've finally gotten to the end of yourself, God is saying, I receive you and I give to you without finding fault. However, if you would trust that I was your God all the time and you would find yourself places where godly people gather to get a, a, a weekly dose, a, a home fellowship, a, a place where I can use my gifts and, and let God move through me freely. When we can do that on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, we begin to find that the hope in our correction is that we get set free from having to pull it all ourselves or standing on the sidelines while we watch the rest of the church. God's calling us. God's offering to us hope in our correction. God's plan is that we get set free of having to do it ourselves. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the, uh, the hope that comes from silencing all the thoughts and all the, the worries and all the clamoring and all the stuff that goes on in our heads so that we can uh, learn to trust you.